Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast in partnership with Dragos, Manufacturing Cyber Threat Perspective. My name is Carol off of SANS, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is Selena Larson, Dragos Cyber Threat Intelligence Analyst. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenter, please enter them into the questions window at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to turn the webcast over to Selena. Great. Thank you so much, Carol. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to hang out with me today. My name is Selena Larson. I'm a senior cyber threat intelligence analyst at Dragos. Uh, we are an industrial cybersecurity company with a threat detection response platform, um, services, for instance, incident response, uh, tabletop exercises, that sort of thing. And then, of course, my team is the threat intelligence team, specifically focused on uh, threats to industrial control systems and hunting bad people trying to take down critical infrastructure. Uh, we also focus on helping ICS asset owners and operators stay safe and secure. So today I'm going to be discussing threats to the manufacturing sector. Uh, based on our research, cyber risk to the manufacturing sector is increasing. This is led by disruptive cyber attacks impacting the industrial processes, intrusions enabling information gathering, process information theft, as well as new activity from ICS targeting adversaries. This presentation is actually based on a report that we published uh, last week called, called the Manufacturing Threat Perspective um, and that has a ton of information. It's a great deep dive into this topic. Um, but today I'm going to be focusing on three key points here. Uh, one is the threats. So what are the biggest threats to the manufacturing sector? Uh, who are the adversaries? What are they targeting? How can they have impact to operations? And then you have OT digital transformation. And what does this mean for cybersecurity? How can we make sure that we are keeping our um, assets, our plant uh, factories secure? And finally, defense. How can companies, how can asset owners and operators protect themselves from these threats and have very robust um, cybersecurity operations? So to get started with the threats, uh, to talk about the ICS targeting activity groups. We currently have five activity groups uh, that are targeting or demonstrating interest in targeting the manufacturing sector. This includes Chrysine, Magnolium, Pyrocyte, Blossomite, and Xenotime. Of these activity groups, Xenotime is considered to be the most um, capable and most dangerous activity group. You might be familiar with this group due to their uh, use of the Trisis malware that targeted safety instrumented systems at a petrochemical facility in Saudi Arabia. Uh, these other groups, um, also are not exclusive to manufacturing um, and have demonstrated targeting in other sectors as well. Um, but these are be the most concerning to asset owners and operators in the manufacturing space. I want to point out here that at Dragos, we don't track actors um, based on the who um, or, you know, for instance, the country that's behind the adversary, but rather we focus on the behaviors, the tactics, techniques, and procedures, the infrastructure and the victimology that we observe from these adversaries targeting manufacturing. So to move on to ICS malware, um, there are currently two activity groups, Nanotime and Electrum, that have demonstrated the ability to interact with and disrupt operations with malware specifically targeting ICS processes. Trisys, that we mentioned before, and Crash Override, which was a malware specifically targeting a, a electric transmission station, can interact with and disrupt industrial processes. Um, Although we have not observed either malware family disrupting manufacturing operations, it is possible that these adversaries will target manufacturing companies in the process of developing such malware, uh, even if they are not the ultimate target. Uh, for example, talking about crash override. So this was a malware that specifically targeted uh, Siemens protect protective relays and ABB equipment um, at an electric transmission substation in Ukraine. So this type of equipment can be found both in some manufacturing facilities in Europe, as well as in the electric operations that support manufacturing facilities. Uh, many uh, many uh, large manufacturing operations do run their own electric operations on site, um, so they will have very similar, um, very similar networks and operations environment to uh, electric, uh, uh, electric operations, utility operations as well. 
Um, an adversary could theoretically leverage manufacturing operations as sort of a, test, a testing ground for disruptive attacks targeting critical infrastructure like electric utilities, again, if the same equipment is used. Uh, and of course, we can't talk about uh, threats to manufacturing and certainly industrial control systems threats without uh, mentioning Stuxnet. So this is, of course, the most infamous ICS malware, I would say. Um, and it was first discovered back in 2010, um, but this was a manufacturing uh, targeting ICS industrial control systems malware. It really was unprecedented at the time um, and the, really the first to cause physical damage to computerized systems. Uh, so I, the most common threat to manufacturing is ransomware. It is a very serious threat. Uh, we certainly observed a dramatic increase over the last year. And, you know, not just to manufacturing, but across the board from an industrial uh, control systems perspective. However, uh, manufacturing, based off of the data that uh, we collected and, and research that we've done, is the uh, highest targeted industry um, and most impacted by ransomware in terms of industrial control systems. Um, Atkins is a really interesting and unique example as uh, it is one of the first in a number of ICS uh, aware ICS targeting ransomware strains. So ransomware adversaries are continuing to develop and include industrial processes in the in the kill lists that they are developing in the malware. So you know being able to to stop the process or or, or stop the functionality of um, various processes and services related to industrial control systems, um, not just your sort of uh, encryption schemes on Windows and enterprise software. So these strains that contain this specific mechanisms do represent a unique risk to industrial operations that we haven't previously observed uh, in ransomware. So in 2020, uh, the number of publicly reported ransomware attacks on manufacturing entities was more than tripled compared to 2019. And ransomware operators are increasingly incorporating data theft techniques into their campaigns to further ransom demands. So this is actually pretty interesting. Um, I find that it is um, part of the ransomware threat, but also part of this sort of supply chain third party um, threat that we're gonna be talking about here in just a little bit. But what we're seeing with adversaries is that encrypting files, encrypting machines is not enough to necessarily receive their payment. As companies are becoming uh, more adept at, you know, recovering from these types of attacks, the adversaries are responding to that by stealing data um, and then holding that for ransom in an effort to sort of further prompt these companies to, um, to, to pay that, that ransom. However, that opens up an opportunity for other adversaries that might be interested in targeting specific industrial control systems uh, companies, being able to see data on customers or vendors or, um, contractors or some of the equipment that's being used. A lot of the information that's being leaked online isn't necessarily unique or specific to PII, for instance, but it can have some uh, sensitive information that's leaked as well and sort of have these more supply chain implications. Uh, most ransomware strains impacting ICS and related entities are still IT focused, um, but ransomware can have these very detrimental indirect access on operations and process control networks um, because it can impact resources like logistics, fleet management, sales operation and fulfillment, um, or loss of view uh, to resource management tools. So here are some examples of some of, the, uh, some of the ransomware attacks that we've seen impacting manufacturing. And like I said, it's been a really difficult year for the sector in terms of ransomware attacks. Um, AFCO, for instance, was a, a, a neat agricultural company, um, so their production was disrupted due to a, a ransomware cyber attack, and it actually impacted the, um, the, the, the employees. They were unable to receive pay. Everest Steel had uh, multiple plant shutdowns um, throughout North America due to ransomware, and again, the employees were unable to work, unable to get paid um, for multiple days. Uh, an attack in, uh, in Germany, global mechanical engineering company Nietzsche, um, was uh, also part of a victim of a ransomware attack, and um, the production was disrupted for days. And then in Canada, again, unfortunately, um, uh, Paper Excellence in Canada also had um, ransomware attacks that disrupted uh, their paper mills, disrupted their plants and manufacturing operations. So this is just all from this year. Um, and there are a number of, of, of other examples that you can use here. Effectively, what we're seeing is ransomware has impacts beyond just sort of encrypting files and, and disrupting sort of business operations. What you're seeing is a potential threat to um, 
to uh, availability of potential threat to safety, um, and then certainly the repercussions of employees and customers and uh, vendors and partners that are also impacted by this, uh, this threat. So moving on to internet exposed assets, um, they are widely used for initial access, both from um, the activity groups that we talked about previously, as well as these ransomware adversaries that are uh, that are sort of targeting sort of big game hunting, looking for large enterprises to be able to sort of to infiltrate those companies. Um, so industrial networking access uh, assets that are exposed to the internet are a high risk for manufacturing that can facilitate initial access into a victim environment. We have multiple activity groups, ICS activity groups that have previously targeted or currently attempt to exploit remote access technology um, or uh, internet exposed login infrastructure, for instance. Parasite, Magnalium, and Xenotime, these are all the groups that we mentioned previously that are uh, of interest to these manufacturing asset owners and operators. Um, Alanite is another activity group that we track as well, um, who has not demonstrated targeting on manufacturing, but does use um, these sort of internet exposed assets and networking infrastructure for initial access. So last year, 66% of incident response cases that Dragos responded to involved adversaries directly accessing the ICS network from the internet. And 100% of organizations had ratable network connections into their operational environments. Um, adversaries are very quick to weaponize and exploit these vulnerabilities in internet facing services. Um, you have certainly RDP, remote desktop protocol, uh, virtual private networks, um, and then certainly critical network infrastructure services like Alpha Network, Citrix, and Juniper. We have seen uh, a lot of these vulnerabilities throughout 2020 coming, uh, coming to light. Um, oftentimes, it's very difficult to patch them. Sometimes you need, you know, multiple steps are required. Sometimes the only way to sort of fix them is to turn off access, restrict access, or disable uh, the functionality entirely until a patch can be uh, can be uh, published. And so what we're seeing is um, these very well, uh, well resourced adversaries, but also very quick to um, uh, identify, develop uh, exploits that can take advantage of these, um, uh, take advantage of these assets. I would also say too, you know, it's not necessarily vulnerabilities that are being um, weaponized and exploited, but also lack security protocols, right? So, you know, utilizing passwords spraying campaigns to these sort of exposed assets in order to potentially um, guess the proper password. Um, very lax password security using these sort of default passwords, username and passwords um, on these exposed devices this is another uh, uh, common and useful initial access tool. Um, you know, this has been become so, uh, so sort of prolific that there have been a number of uh, uh, publications by various governments and intelligence agencies that have come out and said, you know, you know, asset owners and operators, you must restrict exposure of your OT assets to the internet. Um, there have certainly been uh, incidents in which internet exposed assets were used for initial access, as, as was published um, in uh, in Security Week. This uh, event in April, hackers knew how to target PLCs in Israel water facility attacks. Um, you know, they were able to sort of access those devices due to um, poor security uh, mechanisms, as well as this case study uh, that we actually worked on in March when we identified parasite activity leveraging a Citrix Next stick NetScaler application delivery controller for initial, initial access. Uh, those of you who might be familiar with the CD, this 2019, 1971, um, which was first discovered in December 2019. Uh, that was uh, a few months it took between the initial dis disclosure and weaponization. But if you look at exposed assets um, using various resources, uh, you can see that there are still a lot of these types of assets that are vulnerable to, um, to this vulnerability that could potentially be used for initial access. So despite you know, the patches being made available, oftentimes, there might be various reasons why people are slow to patch. Um, it might not be you know, easy to do so. We might be waiting for the next patching cycle, et cetera. Um, but what we're seeing is these internet exposed assets are very interesting targets for adversaries. Moving on to ICS specific vulnerabilities. So what my team does is we're identifying vulnerabilities in uh, ICS equipment, and we're actually also assessing and oftentimes correcting vulnerabilities that are published by um, third-party sources, whether that be um, ICS-CERT or uh, the vendors themselves. 
certainly, you know, independent researchers. But as of October 2020, we've assessed and validated 108 advisories containing 262 vulnerabilities impacting industrial equipment found in manufacturing environments. So that seems like a lot of vulnerabilities, right? Um, and of these, almost half of the advisories described a vulnerability that could cause a loss of view or a loss of control within a compromised environment. So we see a lot of times vulnerable uh, reporting or you know research uh, uh, you know the, this stuff that comes out about industrial control system specific vulnerabilities and the potential that they could cause um, or the potential they have to cause you know sort of loss of view loss of control disruption within an operations environment. But I want to point out here that all of these vulnerabilities that did impact manufacturing industrial equipment, just 70% required access to the victim network in order to exploit, and 26% require an adversary to have access to the vulnerable device itself. 8% um, actually require an adversary to be on the local area network to facilitate exploitation. So I want to point out here that, you know, these vulnerabilities are, are, are you know, certainly important, um, it's really important that they're being reported and identified and hopefully, you know, patched as well. Um, but I want to point out here that a lot of times in order to actually exploit them, an attacker already needs to be on the network. They already have had to have, you know, um, passed the initial exploit or initial access phase, sort of been able to access your OT environment already. Um, even, you know, being on the box itself, right? Like 26% of these uh, vulnerabilities require an adversary to have access to the device already. And if an adversary has access to the device, they could do a lot more than just potentially um, exploiting a vulnerability, but theoretically they could use it for um, other uh, uh, purposes as well without having to um, mess with any of the vulnerabilities. So in terms of, of the use of these types of vulnerabilities, um, if we're talking about ransomware adversaries, which we had mentioned earlier, um, ICS vulnerabilities may not be useful to ransomware adversaries that generally would not have experience to weaponize ICS vulnerabilities. Um, despite incorporating ICS specific protocols into these uh, process kill lists, um, there isn't a lot of evidence or, or, or um, visibility to suggest that the ransomware adversaries actually know how to engage with and manipulate um, industrial control systems and the devices uh, within that environment. So this means that you know, uh, they, if you want to have a direct or specific impa impact uh, within an, uh, an operations environment and be able to sort of modify or exploit an uh, ICS device um, that is vulnerable to a, a potential flaw, um, adversaries will need to know how this works. How does it interact with the rest of the, of, of the environment? What types of, um, you know, how does it communicate? What type, uh, what does it control, and uh, that type of thing. So ransomware adversaries are sort of more traditionally big game hunting. They are going after a lot of different industrial verticals. Um, oftentimes you see them outside, uh, uh, impacting, for instance, schools and hospitals and a lot of different victims. And they're not demonstrating the ability to sort of weaponize or, or understand how these environments work. I would also say too that a lot of these vulnerabilities that you're seeing on MOOC just due to uh, insecurity by default in some ICS equipment. So if an adversary is, is able to sort of access it, uh, a specific device or network, a vulnerability might not even matter if the, the uh, device itself is insecure by design. Um, but what is more of an issue, a great issue, is ICS um, uh, security problems like default credentials, for instance, um, overly permissive file shares, uh, allowing people to have access to um, equipment, services, et cetera, that they don't necessarily need, um, and certainly over permissive local permissions, these types of things that could be more useful to ransomware adversaries or your sort of more um, traditional commodity malware adversaries. Um, so, uh, wrapping up on our, our, our threats piece before we sort of dive into the, um, the, the, the ITOT convergence or, or digital uh, uh, digitization is IP theft. So, operational data is very valuable for a lot of different reasons. Um, IP theft uh, of trade secrets related to process and automation functions can enable industrial organizations and interested states and governments to fast track development. Um, we do assess with high confidence that this type of activity, um, including IP theft and industrial espionage, major threats to manufacturing entities. Um, 
that can support state-sponsored activities for political or national security efforts. Um, and maintaining uh, material specifications for products is likely not enough to replicate them. Uh, adversaries may want to steal the algorithms, engineering designs, and programming specifications to replicate the entire production process, not just the material, goods, and services output. So this is something that's pretty interesting and why an adversary might target or be interested in targeting um, the, the information and, and data that lives in an OT environment to facilitate IP theft. Um, the, because so much of manufacturing is, 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 is relying on, on precision and automation and uh, you know, very, very specific uh, uh, designs and mechanisms and ingredients, an adversary will need to identify the information that's available on the operations uh, environment, whether that's historic uh, data, for instance, or um, chemical processing data, um, the exact amounts of things for uh, pharmaceuticals, for instance how it's being uh, manufactured and what is being manufactured is just as important as the output itself. Um, and certainly when we're talking about you know, automation, uh, al uh, algorithms with AI-based uh, manufacturing processes, that type of thing, um, is, is very, very interesting to adversaries who are trying to replicate the entire process and not just the products. So, um, Talking about you know, coronavirus impacts and how that might play a role in sort of IP theft threats. Um, this is you know, without a doubt the biggest issue currently facing us. And it is meaning that um, pharmaceutical uh, manufacturers, certainly healthcare, certain biotechnology, um, organizations that are working on the research and development of coronavirus vaccine um, and other, uh, other healthcare are related to the pandemic are very much at risk for this type of activity. We see from uh, multiple different government sources and intelligence sources that um, uh, are publicly uh, demonstrating the uh, uh, recent attacks and recent attempts um, to target the, the research and development working on COVID-19 vaccine um, and for you know, intelligence gathering and uh, as potentially espionage purposes. Uh, there are multiple APT groups from various different um, uh, uh, state back uh, threat actors that are in interested in this. But I also wanna point out too, you know, the, the, uh, it's not just potentially these um, state back actors that are interested in potentially disrupting operations or targeting these organizations. Um, here on, on the lower right is an example of a ransomware attack that targeted Dr. Reddy's, which is an Indian um, pharmaceutical manufacturer that's working with Russia on developing its vaccine. Shortly after this company announced its stage two production of um, a coronavirus vaccine, it experienced a ransomware attack that significantly disrupted its operations. Uh, it, it, it was very interesting, the timing itself uh, the, the, the extent to which the operational dis uh, disruptive impacts had um, is, is very interesting. And you can see why, you know, for instance, a ransomware actor might want to target a, uh, an entity that's developing, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals in a race to, to help people um, uh, sort of cure um, the coronavirus pandemic. So it's, uh, it's very interesting to see, you know, with coronavirus and the, the impact that it's having on um, the, the manufacturing threat landscape and we do anticipate this to continue um, for the foreseeable future. So moving on to discussing uh, third party and uh, supply chain um, and essentially kind of discussing how, you know, adversaries can leverage these trusted connections between the asset owners and operators and their, um, their vendors or their contractors uh, to uh, enable access. So, so these types of, of, of third party uh, connections, whether it's contractors, vendors, et cetera, often have direct access to operational environments for activities like updates, um, inspections, or new equipment installations. Um, enterprise resource planning uh, providers are potential infection vectors that could bridge the ITOT gap if proper segmentation and security are not in place. Um, ERP services uh, generally requ would require access to operations assets like data historians in order to monitor and store information relating to production, supply chain, inventory, and safety. And if these communications are two-way, uh, any of these sort of, uh, of, of trusted connections, our, our two-way communications, it can enable a potential hijacking that 
connected connection in order to gain initial access um, to those organizations. We have seen activity groups uh, that have used compromised vendors and contractors um, for phishing campaigns, for example. Um, this was uh, with Dymo and Alan targeting the electric sector. Um, and Zenotime, again, the, the activity group that we mentioned earlier, has targeted several original equipment manufacturers and vendors um, for, uh, for uh, initial access. Certainly, we've seen um, hijack connections between managed service providers um, and their customers, which included a number of manufacturing organizations um, in the last uh, uh, couple of years. So I would say, too, that oftentimes we think of um, supply chain and third-party connections as uh, you know, the, the rice sized chip on a motherboard kind of thing that's, a, that's implanted surreptitiously uh, in the manufacturing process. But it can be everything from software and services to emails, to business email compromises, um, to uh, uh, the various connections that you have with your vendor for um, security updates, for instance. There's a lot of opportunity there for adversaries to sort of hijack those um, trusted connections for initial access. There's also, uh, you know, an, an interesting um, piece here too, that manufacturing entities are part of a global supply chain um, that support multiple other industries that make them a target for adversaries targeting industry, industries like electric utility um, or pharmaceutical, both of which we've mentioned earlier in this presentation. Some manufacturing companies' activities stretch into multiple industrial verticals. Um, a really good example of this is Volks, this Volkswagen's um, piece here uh, that plans to tap electric car batteries to compete with power firms. Um, so it, it's kind of a, a merging of multiple worlds, right? And, and which will require you know, different, uh, different um, industrial networks and equipment to support. Uh, it's also here, what's interesting to me too, is just how reliant the world is on manufacturing to support a global supply chain regardless of the industry. And it's very interesting to me to see, you know, the, the, the potential impacts or consequences of manufacturing attacks and disrupting, having sort of ripple effects, right? Like poking, pushing a domino and the rest falling. Um, I wanted to share a story actually that my dad the other day was texting me that he ordered a computer part from overseas and uh, it was taking a very, very long time and he had received an email update from um, the, the shipper that due to a ransomware attack on a, a major shipping and logistics company um, that was, uh, that was you know, bringing his uh, device from overseas, he couldn't get his computer part. <laughs> and it was very interesting that it, to think about you know, these giant container ships with uh, loads of, of goods and products that are you know, coming from a manufacturing facility being distributed logistics to the end user and the consumer, each of those pieces are going to have some sort of impact um, because of a, uh, a, a modification or a, a threat to um, the manufacturing supply chain. Uh, so I uh, wanted to talk about net network segmentation a little bit because flat networks are very common um, in the manufacturing environment. It is really not unusual to see uh, network connections that are shared across both the enterprise and operational um, segments. Uh, this does make it very easy for an adversary to bridge the ITOT boundary and potentially disrupt manufacturing operations after pivoting from an access point within the enterprise. Uh, some of the major issues are interconnections, again, between IT and OT, just via poor segmentation, maintenance interconnections between environments, um, and again, the sort of lack of access restrictions. Um, really, you don't want it to be a free-for-all for, um, for you know, any folks to be able to access all of the equipment. Um, and oftentimes, the segmentation does exist between enterprise and operations. Uh, using jump posts and access restrictions. Uh, manufacturing facilities often leverage the same wide area network connection across all manufacturing plants. So essentially you get you know, your network architecture established and then you just select all, copy and paste that across um, all of the different um, uh, plants or, or uh, facilities that you have. Um, so certainly that is a, uh, a potential risk as well. Um, so, uh, in addition to sort of internet connected process automation and other sort of smart quote unquote manufacturing and in, in, in the industrial internet of things type of equipment, operators are adop adopting Wi-Fi enabled machine tools and diagnostic equipment. 
Um, this can enable workers to move around plants and factories without tripping over power cords. Um, internet connected tools uh, connect to historian databases for quality assurance, regulatory, and logistics purposes, um, among a variety of other reasons. Uh, so while it's great and um, to be able to provide your workers with um, you know, lower uh, potential safety risks without having to trip over things, um, but also just ease of use and being able to um, get data faster and be able to communicate with all of the necessary uh, devices and each other. Um, tools that are connected to enterprise or operations resources and used as network access points or targeted in an attack meant to disrupt operations. So the more things are connected, the more uh, uh, of, a, of potential initial access or, or access points um, that exist within a network. And again, this kind of goes back to um, ensuring access restrictions, ensuring um, uh, very secure enclaves where these types of equipment can be connected and separated from the more uh, the operations network specifically. Uh, so just in time, manufacturing um, applications and services are very, very crucial. Um, these types of logistics enable uh, moving parts of manufacturing assets, whether that's vehicles, drivers, goods, um, to communicate and interact with your more static assets, like the warehouses or human resources. So there's definitely a lot of moving parts that are very, very reliant on, on being on time, uh, being very precise, um, and these all sort of rely on um, these uh, Wi-Fi internet connections. Uh, employees and contractors will also use mobile and desktop hardware with Wi-Fi connections to use applications and services that are required uh, for their uh, for their work, um, as well as for personal uh, personal communications. Um, they regularly access enterprise and, in some cases, access operations networks as well. So you have a lot of this kind of going in and out, uh, popping up and, and uh, disappearing and, and potentially um, introducing a lot of different um, potential for, um, for additional communications and additional threats. So one of the, uh, the issues that we see pretty regularly is a lack of visibility. Um, I kind of use this phrase, sort of building a house without a foundation if you're trying to you know, establish a very, very robust cybersecurity um, team and journey without having you know, a, a, a very strong understanding of visibility of your network. Um, so connections are increasing, like we were saying you know, previously with the, the sort of digital uh, digitization. Um, but there's a lack of visibility into processes, assets, and communications. And when I say that, I'm not saying, you know, you don't know the number of HMIs, EWS, PLCs in your network, but rather, what can communicate with those? Um, what ports are open? Is it two-way one-way communication? Are there uh, servers that you don't know are, uh, are um, communicating with the operations environment? Who has access to the tools and resources and assets that are actually on your network. Um, should this asset be communicating with everyone or should it just be communicating uh, with one master um, asset? So you have you know, uh, a, a lot of, 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 of different uh, communications, assets and operations that need, um, you need visibility into in order to properly defend your network. 81% of organizations that we worked with last year had extremely limited or no visibility into the ICS or OT network. Um, and this is based on observations from incident response engagements. Um, and we found no instances of security and process data aggregation for incident analysis, requiring manual retrieval of logs and distributed analysis. Um, so essentially, essentially um, gaining visibility into that data, aggregating that data um, can both be very proactive in terms of defense as well as uh, improve reactive uh, uh, efforts when a particular event happens. So now to kind of go over some of the defensive recommendations that we have, um, I really did want to give a shout out to MITRE ATT&CK for ICS here. Dragos did uh, help um, with the development of this along with uh, multiple other security companies. So major shout out to MITRE ATT&CK for putting this together. If you're already familiar with using MITRE ATT&CK for enterprise, um, then you'll know that, that the framework can be very, very useful, whether you're you know, just starting out on your cybersecurity journey and developing the team um, and, and processes and procedures for that, as well as those of you who have very robust 
uh, cybersecurity teams, um, SOCs, leveraging threat intelligence, et cetera. So it's, this is a very, very useful framework, um, and it enables you to look for threat behaviors and known tactics, techniques, and procedures that adversaries are targeting uh, manufacturing needs. Um, again, you know, the, the MITRE attack for ICS is a very useful sort of map and framework um, that you can kind of go through and say, all right, what types of adversaries are using what types of behavior in operations environment, and is it possible for us to defend against it? Are we currently already uh, able to do that? So just a quick shout out to MITRE um, for that. So in manufacturing, is a very large umbrella that has a number of, of industries underneath it, right? So we've we've been talking, you know, very uh, uh, manufacturing in sort of a broad uh, uh, sphere here. Um, and so defensive recommendations might change depending on um, the the uh, various restrictions um, or regulations that an organization might have. Um, and uh, so it's not all are created equal. It's not to include four very important defensive recommendations that all manufacturing entities um, should adopt. And we have, uh, again, the paper that we published recently has a number of additional defensive recommendations that I think are very useful as well, but these are kind of the four key ones that I wanted to call out. So it's very, very important to ensure an understanding of network interdependencies um, and conduct crown jewel analysis to identify potential weaknesses that could disrupt business continuity. Uh, Again, it's kind of goes back to, to, to gaining that visibility, understanding what's on your network, figuring out what are those crown jewels and what are some of the consequences that could occur if uh, they are compromised or um, otherwise disrupted. Uh, and then you can kind of use that sort of crown jewel analysis, um, crown jewel defense to uh, build sort of resilience cybersecurity um, across the network, focusing on um, the crown jewels. So ensuring networks are segmented to the greatest extent possible. Again, <laughs> I, I harped a lot on network segmentation in this um, in this presentation, but it's very, very important. Um, and you really want to ensure emergency response plans are well documented to detail segmentation efforts in case of an emergency. So if it's not possible to segment your network at all times, um, you should implement firewall rules that enable you to segment critical ICS components from the network. Um, they could be activated and deactivated depending on the safety and security of the environment and any potential malicious activity. So it, it just, you know, doing as much as you can that is possible. Um, certainly, you know, a well-segmented network is, is very, very important. Um, but again, uh, there are ways and opportunities to be able to um, do it temporarily, for instance, uh, to ensure um, uh, very robust security in the event of an emergency. Uh, so services and equipment that are not needed for real-time communication or access to operations should be virtualized. Um, this can improve vulnerability management um, and enable improved security for interdependencies. And then you also want to isolate equipment and services that are used for building access control and heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. So back and back. These services can be considered secondary or support systems that are critical to maintaining safe, reliable manufacturing operations and considered potential targets for adversaries seeking to disrupt manufacturing production. Um, this is one of those things I think that can be very easily for, uh, forgotten, certainly, um, but by building access control, right, you want to make sure that only the right people are able to access your um, access the plant. Um, you want to make sure to, to be able to see who's coming and going. Um, Certainly, uh, with HVAC, for instance, you want to make sure that things are kept cool, both the actual manufacturing process, the service that are required for, for, um, for this work, as well as the, um, the, the workers and the safety of the workers, right? Ensuring, you know, that, that chemical co chemicals aren't, aren't you know, uh, are, are, are being removed from the air and uh, people are, are staying safe and healthy um, in the environment itself. So these are kind of sort of secondary or support systems, but they are just as crucial um, when it comes to operations. So that was my presentation that I had for you all today. Um, thank you so much for coming to hang out with me and I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Um, if you don't want to ask on the webinar, you can totally uh, hit us up, info at dragos.com. Uh, I'm also all over the interwebs, um, so you can find me, find me there as well if you wanted to continue the conversation. But um, do we have any questions?
All right, thanks for that great presentation. We have some questions ready for the Q&A. However, if anyone has a question for Selena, please enter them into the questions window now. Our first one asks, uh, it came about, uh, let's see, 10 minutes into the webcast. It says, for the ransomware with manufacturers, was the malware on the ICS or did it interrupt operations by taking down the IT only? So that's a great question and the answer is it depends. We have actually seen incidents where uh, ransomware was able to um, impact um, the operations specifically directly from the internet. For instance, they're talking when we mentioned um, the sort of exposed assets. So we have seen, um, for instance, RVP uses an, an initial access for operations and it did actually impact uh, multiple um, ICS uh, uh, devices and equipment used in, um, in the, the targeted facility. Um, Again, when we're talking about Ekans uh, or other uh, of the ransomware that had this sort of ICS specific process kill lists, um, they are able to sort of identify thought processes related to ICS if they're able to access the operations environment. And also what you see a lot of times is, is you know, gaining access to uh, domain controllers, active directory, and, and oftentimes those are not well uh, segmented or, or, you know, uh, differentiated from enterprise to operations and so an adversary might be able to sort of push out the ransomware via dc compromise um to both of uh, of of those networks um but then on the flip side too we do see that you know oftentimes it impacts will have um the disruptive effects on ot just because of the reliance of, of software and services that are kind of thought as business functions um, or enterprise functions that are integrated uh, within the ot so um so yeah, the answer is it depends, but we have seen both. All right, thanks. Uh, for the ICS vulnerability slide, does it imply that 30% of the vulnerabilities do not require access to the network? No, so um, so that, that was a, uh, a, a um, I'm trying to think of how the, um, what the slide was. I'm so sorry. It's like paused. Um, but no. So that is just based on the um, the vulnerability uh, assessments that we have done through 2020. Um, and oftentimes it means that you know they they either re require um, local access or network access, right? So if we're talking about on this, the critical vulnerability scoring system score, um, the attack vector will e either be um, local or or um, network. So um, that is not to say that all of them do, but I think that was just uh, they either need network access or additional um uh, additional levels of access but we did expand on that in the report itself that you can find on the website all right thank you seen any currently active apts working on attacks over air gaps so none of the activity groups that we track currently targeting industrial control systems are um, leveraging, uh, uh, you know, sort of techniques to sort of bridge the air gap. There have been some interesting pieces of research come out um, throughout 2020 that kind of talked about uh, USB malware that uh, is trying to infect those sort of um, uh, the, the USB and, and related devices um, very specifically, which could theoretically be used to bridge air gaps. Um, but again, there hasn't been really any evidence of, of that uh, occurring, and we, have, we haven't seen that from the activity groups um, that we track. Uh, certainly, USB malware, that type of thing, has been used uh, before in, in, some, um, uh, in some attacks on critical infrastructure. But in terms of uh, the activity groups that we're seeing, uh, not really. And also, when you're talking about air gaps, we, we find that... Um, Oftentimes, people will think that their networks are air gapped, and they they really aren't. Um, there are going to be some connections in there um, uh, that that again is 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 really really important to make sure that you have that visibility in your network because more often than not, you're going to identify something that you didn't realize was communicating, um, and uh, uh, perhaps a device that should be there um, or the access again should be restricted um, or even even just you know restricting uh, different communication ports itself, right? So. Um, so I would I would be uh, I, I would advise to definitely take a look and and if you you know if you're thinking that we have a, a an air gap um, certainly take a look at that and and make sure that you do have the the correct visibility when it comes to that sort of thing. Um, but again, the research on um, on on USB malware this year there's been a couple 
And while interesting doesn't necessarily mean it's specifically targeting air gap networks. All right, thanks. Uh, someone says, thank you so much for the presentation. It was awesome. <laughs> All right, Thanks the for coming. <laughs> the next question asks, how do I know or define that a system is OT slash ICS? Well, so, so, so IT versus OT, right? So IT is information technology, OT is operations technology, and then ICS is sort of industrial control systems. So the oper operational technology is sort of an umbrella term that we use for um, the four technology that controls the industrial processes. Um, so you can think of OT, for instance, uh, an engineering workstation that's what running a Windows operating system, right? So, so it's Windows OS, which you would find in IT, but it is controlling the operations um, that are that are required, you know, on the engineering workstation. Um, versus industrial control systems, these are going to be things um, like field devices, programmable logic controllers, um, that type of thing. Uh, and so, oftentimes at um, uh, at, at, at different, um, uh, you know, different facilities, you might have different security teams, right? You're gonna you're gonna have your OT security team. You're gonna have your, you know, your 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 uh, uh, engineering engineers and operators, and then you'll have your IT team, um, which are the folks that are working on information um, security for the enterprise. Um, and uh, there's actually a really great talk by my colleague, Leslie, you can find it on YouTube. Uh, Leslie Carhart talked about um, confessions of an IT OT marriage counselor, where she discusses you know, some, of the, some of the differences in between these two different security teams and how you can kind of you know, come together and, and sort of bridge these gaps, whether it's knowledge gaps, communication gaps, um, and, and really create a sort of robust security team that addresses the needs and, and uh, requirements from both sides of the house. Thank you. Uh, other than ransomware, what is the next most common malware family commonly seen? Oh, you know, I don't even, I don't even know. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think it depends. I mean, it depends on, on like, if we're tar talking about um, victimology. Um, you know what, though? I would say that there is uh, still sort of um, these, these, older malware worms. I don't want to say that it's, it's very common or like second to ransomware. That's not at all what I'm trying to say, but you will often find malware strains that are older, like Configure, for instance, um, that have, you know, oh my gosh, over like a decade old, and it's still sort of, you know, worming its way through uh, uh, industrial operations just due to, um, you know, the, 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 the type of security that you see in some of these environments, right? Like some of this equipment, is still running very, very old versions of Windows. Um, doesn't necessarily get uh, the most up-to-date patches. So you see sort of some of these older sort of uh, uh, malware worms that don't actually really do much when it comes to impacting the operations, but they will appear. Um, but Emotet is another huge one um, that actually fell off a little bit in 2020, um, but it definitely came back uh, a, a throughout the latter half of this year. Um, that is, uh, that's a Trojan that is a dropper for um, other malware. Certainly you see a lot of Emotet and Reeve ransomware combinations, um, but Emotet is something that we see pretty regularly. And then TrickBot, which was the banking Trojan. Um, that was another one uh, that, you know, that you've seen sort of targeting a lot of various uh, industries and certainly not just manufacturing, um, but with the takedown of uh, from Microsoft and, and um, Cyber Command and, and stuff that's that's dropped off uh, certainly in the last month, but still there. So that's a tough question. I, I wish I had. I wish I knew the answer actually off the top of my head. All right. Well, thanks for taking a shot at it. <laughs> <laughs> Any reported OT attacks with physical damage reported? Um, like OT cyber attacks, I mean, so certainly Sexnet is a great example of that, right? Having actual um, physical impacts to the, uh, to the operations. Um, I guess, I guess it really kind of depends on how an entity or organization is going to define a physical impact. Um, uh, certainly Trisis was, a, a, an example of, you know, um, having equipment sort of fail safe. Uh, so that had um, a direct impact uh, within operations. Um, but in terms of, of, I guess, if we're talking about like ransomware sort of compromising safety or something, 
um, I don't think I am aware of any of that. I don't want to say that it doesn't exist, <laughs> um, but I, I am not aware of it. Okay, thank you. Uh, can VPN or VLANs be a vector of ransomware or other viruses into the slash SCADA? Definitely, if it is exposed, uh, or if you have those types of connections, um, and you know, if uh, certainly as we're seeing with coronavirus, uh, a lot of people are beginning to work more remotely, establishing sort of um, virtual access, remote access to um, to ICS that hadn't necessarily been there before. And unfortunately, you know, if these login um, uh, portals aren't, aren't well defended, uh, or you know, again, if it's using commonly commonly used passwords, not having multi-factor authentication. Uh, not having um, very robust uh, uh, security protections in general, um, you will uh, see them be targeted by um, various adversaries in an attempt to gain initial access, certainly. Um, oftentimes it's targets of opportunity, but oftentimes it is, you know, if, if you are uh, 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 targeted, like Parasite, for instance, Parasite is an ICS focused um, adversary and they have used vulnerabilities in, in to to, um, to to attempt exploitation of victims. Thank you. Can devices with default vendor passwords be used to pivot to more valuable targets? Is it common? Um, I'm not necessarily sure that I have you know like hard numbers on that, but certainly default passwords are a very real risk to industrial operations. You know, you have tons of uh, you have, you know, a number of devices, right? Like potentially hundreds of PLCs, for instance. Um, and uh, it, it's very common for operators to just continue using the default uh, uh, username and password just because of the amount of work that it would take to um, change each uh, each piece of equipment to its own username and password and update it on um, a regular basis to comp comply with, uh, for instance, security policies of the organization. So it's a lot of work. So you do see um, that you'll have default usernames and passwords, but I mean, certainly like any, um, any uh, uh, you know, pivot point, um, you know, if, if, if uh, an adversary is, is, you know, conducting lateral movement, for instance, and they're able to uh, log into an engineering workstation or HMI via default credentials, um, that's certainly an avenue for uh, further uh, further potential attacks. Uh, thanks, Selena. Uh, the next one says, as I understand patching ICS assets is a decision not to be taken lightly as there might be other solutions to mitigate, it says of vulnerabilities or maybe a vulnerability. Uh, what would you suggest to take as a basis for a decision to patch or to find another way to mitigate? Yeah, so that's really a question about risk, right? Um, so uh, you, you really want to make sure that you're weighing um, all of the variables that, that go into the type of risk that you're willing to accept as an asset owner and operator. Um, certainly when it comes to um, industrial control system vulnerabilities, there are a lot of different uh, 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 requirements, I guess, when it comes to ICS versus IT, right? Like you can't just patch the, <laughs> your box overnight. Um, it requires a lot of testing. Um, it requires uh, oftentimes a lot of downtime. What you'll see in industrial environments certainly is these sort of six month patching cycles where you know they'll they'll kind of just build up the vulnerabilities and then go it, do it all in one fell swoop. Um, uh, it really depends on the the level of risk that you're willing to accept as an organization. But to your point, there are are uh, ways that you can sort of practice this idea of like defense in depth, right? So restricting various um, ports and pro protocols, um, ensuring that only the devices that need to be communicating with each other are doing that, um, ensuring access restrictions, right? Um, like only give people um, limited access to um, the device or uh, service and certainly ensure that, you know, administrative access is even tight, more tightly restricted. Um, so there are ways that you can um, ensure that you know the the uh, potentially vulnerable devices are are def well defended even if you can't necessarily patch them. Thank you. Are threat groups typical intent to interrupt industrial processes or infect products that then can be exploited at an end user? 
Um, so again, it depends. <laughs> um, uh, for the most part, the activity groups that we're seeing, for instance, with, with uh, trisis and crash overhead, these were uh, specifically targeted to the, um, the environments themselves. And in the case of crash overhead, it had uh, a disruptive effect. Um, and, you know, in Kiev, Ukraine, um, for uh, about an hour. And then in the case of trisis, you know, that was targeting the safety equipment. And although it failed safe, it could have had impacts uh, to the environment itself, whether it was the safety of the uh, workers or, you know, the potentially an environmental um, environmental impact. Um, so, so that's what I would say say to that to that end. Um, certainly with ransomware, I think that um, there's a little bit there. They're, they're kind of cruel, I guess I would call, I'm call it ransomware adversaries like pretty cruel because they do have a lot of impacts that go beyond just the company itself, like the workers, for instance, or people receiving the items that they've ordered or, you know, when it comes to healthcare, for example, that's a huge, huge issue that we're seeing. So, um, but yeah, with the, with the malware that we're seeing necessarily uh, is, is more targeted towards the environment. Thanks, Selena. Uh, this last one says, is multi, an effective deterrent to malevolent actors. I've heard that multi-authentication is not the most effective security measure anymore. So yes, it is. It is good. It is very important. So multi-factor authentication is very important. Um, however, I, SMS based, so text messaging based authentication um, isn't necessarily as robust, for instance, as having a um, uh, an authenticator application, or for instance, uh, a security key, like a physical security key that that you carry on your person and have it uh, as your second factor. So I would say that yes, MFA is very important. It is uh, a very useful tool in deterring uh, adversaries. Um, however, depending on your threat model, uh, SMS-based, so text messaging, um, two-factor authentication might not be um, the, the the best or most <laughs> the best route to go, just due to um, some potential uh, vulnerabilities or, or uh, the ability to sort of manipulate um, uh, like telecommunications actually intercept text messages. So um, again, that kind of goes back to um, to uh, assessing your risk and conducting your own sort of threat models. Um, but yes, yes, uh, multi-factor authentication is, is very, very good, very important. The best is a physical security key. Um, if not that, an authenticator app. Uh, and then, you know, if, if not SMS-based, uh, multi-factor All right, thanks. And another one popped in. It says, what are the typical types of actors do you see attacking local, county, and tribal waters, utilities, or smaller water utilities? Oh, that's a good question, actually. So what we're seeing a lot of is, is um, ransomware attackers tend to, tend to target those sort of um, SLTT um, uh, uh, organizations. Um, we haven't, or at least there hasn't been publicly documented um, events of a uh, ransomware adversary having a an impact on um, the safety availability uh, or flow of, of water. However, we have seen some utilities um, be impacted in terms of, of not being able to have payments. Uh, the, the customers can't pay. There has been um, the facilities, the, the, the headquarters themselves being you know locked up and ransomed. Um, but we haven't seen a real operations impact when it comes to water utilities at that level. Um, and it's, it's, it's largely ransomware when it comes to SLTD. Oh, and another one just popped in. <laughs> <laughs> Organizations or are they state sponsored? It sounds like a follow up. Sorry, what was the, what was the first part of that question? Sure, it says, are they criminal organizations or are they state sponsored? Oh, in regards to ransomware. Um, so that's a good question. Um, generally, ransomware adversaries are considered to be criminal elements. There have been some um, reported events of possibly state backed actors leveraging ransomware um, uh, for uh, in their operations, but currently um, they are umbrella, uh, lumped on, under the sort of criminal, cyber criminal umbrella. All right, thanks. And that's all, all we have for today and, and uh, pretty close to all the time we have. Thank you so much, Selena and Dragos, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. 
For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.